Watching Chris with the How to Survive podcast, it was suddenly so clear. The podcast would never stop. It would never leave him. And it would never hurt him. Never shout at him, or get drunk and hit him, or say it was too busy to spend time with him. It would always be there, on iTunes and SoundCloud, on your podcast app of choice. And it would die to protect him. Of all the would-be fathers that came and went over the years, this thing, this podcast, was the only one that measured up. In an insane world, it was the sanest choice. Hello and welcome to episode 94 of the How to Survive podcast. There are 94 podcasts in the How to Survive canon. That's one. (laughs) What what line is that? You broke my arm! (laughs) (laughs) All right, yeah. 210 bones in the human body. 215, actually. But yes, this is episode 94 of the How to Survive podcast. And today we're covering the 1991 James Cameron classic Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Yep, as it's spelled on uh, American soil. Yes. Uh, so if you haven't seen Terminator 2, the follow-up to The Terminator, then uh, now is your chance to go and watch it. Um, there's a big twist, isn't there, Joe, in the narrative? Yeah. Which, unfortunately, is spoiled in all the trailers, Yeah. almost all of the posters, the back of the DVD box, and indeed the description on Amazon Prime Video, if you yeah. were watching you, it on yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, my girlfriend wasn't aware of it until two seconds before I pressed play on the Amazon link, because she's, you know, not... not part of the world yeah. that cares about Terminator 2 and I was really looking forward to uh, seeing her reaction uh, when the twist happened mm-hmm. um, unfortunately that that was stolen from me by the person who writes the descriptions on Amazon so thanks for that whoever you are yeah. maybe um, we should we get them on grill them about their, their choices yeah them and the people who uh, choose the screen grabs on Netflix yeah. for films yeah, unfortunate choices all. Yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, as we said, final warning, Terminator 2, uh, as we recap the plot ahead of talking about how to survive. And we should say that this week and next week are um, sort of two special episodes on, what would you call it, Joe? Our personal fears? Yes, I think it's personal fear season or... Uh, <laughs> yeah, phobia season. Yeah. I don't know. Fears so, and phobias. And so why are we covering Terminator 2? It represents my biggest fear. Yeah. In in my, next week's your strong fear. women. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, wait, that's the descent. Next yeah, week. Sorry, yeah. Next week, me. next week's the descent, and that's yours, which is a fear yeah. of uh, darkness. I think. Uh, no, it's uh, a fear of getting trapped in a cave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Underground yeah. with no hope yeah. of rescue. It's a bit more nuanced than that, but you'll have to wait until next week to yeah. find out why. Yeah. And the descent, by the way, is on uh, Netflix. So get and watch it ahead yeah. of next week. Yeah. Terminator 2, we both watched on Amazon Prime. Yeah. That's where that is. So do yes. that instead. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, why, why are we watching Terminator 2? Because I'm scared of nuclear bombs. Yes, correct. Right. Well, uh, yes, spoilers ahead for the recap of Terminator 2 and we'll look forward to uh, speaking in detail about uh, the like, <laughs> upcoming nuclear apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. My biggest fear. Discuss that length on microphone. That's what yes, I enjoy. On a on a sort of um, facile podcast. <laughs> yeah. So Terminator 2. The year is 1995 and following the events of The Terminator, Sarah Connor has been locked in an asylum for attempting to bomb a computer factory. Mm. Her son, John, delinquent youth and future leader of the resistance in the war against machines, lives with his foster parents, Todd and Janelle. Sarah has prepared him throughout his childhood for the forthcoming war against the machines and for Judgment Day, which is the day Skynet takes control of the USA's nuclear Mm. arsenal and three billion uh, people die? Yes, in in, in the opening monologue, mm. Sarah says that the when, the when the bombs start falling, the survivors call it Judgment Day in, in retrospect. Yes. Um, anyway, back in 1995, a T-800 model Terminator arrives from the future and seeks out John, while another apparently human person from the future does the same. The T-800, of course, is Arnie. The three, being the two 
time travellers and John Connor intersect at a shopping mall where it is revealed that the man who is now dressed as a policeman is in fact a T-1000, which is a new model of Terminator constructed from a liquid metal alloy Mm. and able to mould itself into any shape as well as regenerate at will and take on the appearance of any person. The T-800 model, meanwhile, has been reprogrammed by future John Connor to protect his past self. So the T-800, uh, which from this point onwards we'll just call Arnie. Yeah, Arnold. Yeah, Arnie rescues John from the T-1000, who attempts to lure John home by killing and impersonating his foster parents. John and Arnie instead head to the asylum to rescue Sarah, who is herself conveniently staging a prison break at the same moment. The trio have another brush with the T-1000, but are able to escape. As they drive, John laboriously teaches Arnie about human emotions and teenage slang. Though Sarah was initially terrified at the sight of Arnie, she soon realises that as a machine programmed to protect her son that will never age get tired or emotional, the Terminator is in fact a perfect father figure. Mm. This is genuinely something that she says in the film. Yes. Uh, Her perfect father figure is a robot from the future. Well, that was in our our opening gag. We we made a joke about the the How to Survive podcast being a perfect father figure. Yeah. Not that far off. No. It was word for word. (laughs) No, I mean, it's not far off. Right. Choosing a robot, saying a toaster or or a a computer program. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. After gathering weapons and supplies from an old acquaintance, Sarah splits from the group and heads to the home of Miles Bennett Dyson, a Cyberdyne engineer working on a new type of vacuum cleaner, so a, a new type of neural net processor, <laughs> which will go on to form the basis for Skynet. His designs are based on a chip that was salvaged from what remained of the original film's T-800. An attempt to assassinate Dyson at his home goes awry when she is unable to kill him in front of his children. John and Arnie arrive and inform Dyson of the destruction his work will go on to cause. He agrees to help them break into Cyberdyne and destroy his prototypes. Though the team successfully break in, alarms are triggered, summoning police, many of whom are dealt with non-lethally by Arnie, because uh, Arnie has been instructed by John Mm. to uh, not kill anyone. Yeah, and he he has to follow any orders that John gives him. Yeah, including stand on one leg or whatever. Yeah, or like, yeah, Yeah. eat an ice cream or anything, (laughs) anything, anything he orders him to do. Yeah. Meanwhile, Dyson is fatally wounded when a SWAT team arrive and he uses a dead man switch to detonate explosives, destroying his work while Sarah, John and Arnie escape with the remains of the original T-800. The T-1000 returns, this time in a helicopter, and relentlessly pursues the trio, eventually cornering them in a steel mill. Arnie and the T-1000 engage in combat and Arnie is clearly outmatched by his advanced adversary. Mm leading to his apparent system failure when uh, the T-1000 drives a big, what is it, bit of rebar or steel pole or yeah. something through his back. You, you did miss out one one part there, which is when the, the truck driven by the T-1000, yeah. which is full of liquid nitrogen, yeah. bursts open and he's kind of frozen solid, mm-hmm. but then he thaws like within about five seconds yeah. and continues as normal that's why i didn't include it because it doesn't go anywhere it's it's important because i think it's going to come up later in discussion fair enough okay um yeah he is he is temperature sensitive uh so yeah so arnie is uh arnie is dead his his systems have failed yeah the t-1000 returns to stalking john and sarah even torturing and impersonating sarah to lure john out However, Arnie miraculously returns at the crucial moment and forces the T-1000 into a pool of molten metal, destroying it entirely. John tosses the remains of the T-800 into the molten metal, but is distraught as he realises that Arnie must be destroyed as well to ensure his technology cannot be reverse engineered. Sarah lowers him into the molten metal and he too is destroyed, giving a tearful John one final thumbs up. Driving into an unknown future, Sarah muses that if a machine can learn the value of human life, maybe we can too. <sighs> so that's Terminator 2, Judgment yeah. Day. It's it's much better when you're watching it. It is, like, yeah. when, you, when you put it on paper, it's not as good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. If you if you went through the pitching process, just just to go back, right? So Terminator One is like a really tight, high concept. Like, oh, imagine uh, a robot is sent through time to kill the leader of the resistance in the war against the machines. Yeah, well, nice his idea. mother. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. To stop her, him being born. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Now, a robot is sent. A robot has been reprogrammed and mm. sent back to save the person who would become the re- leader, leader of the resistance machine. Who will go on to reprogram him. Yeah. So that's one like loop, yeah. causal loop. Yeah. And the person who he's fighting against is a liquid metal man. Yeah. Uh, and you could tell like, in the studio, they were like, okay, okay, I like it. Is yeah. Arnold in it? Yep. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Signed off. Mm. So it's a... It's a it's not as tight a concept. No, it's not. Um, so, I mean, we'd both seen this before a number of times. I would say, I've, like, I was thinking this this morning, right? I've seen it probably three times since I was able to ha- form critical opinions about films right. properly. Yeah. The first time I was like, this is you know, a tightly made film, it's good. Yeah. Second time I was like, this is hammy and uh, irritating. Yeah. And like a, 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 a harsh diversion from the original. This yeah. time I watched it last night and I've got to say, it's not as bad. It's it's it's, it, it's it's a very solid film. Yeah, with some irritations in it. Yeah. Now I think you and I watched what must be the director's cut. Okay. Um, which is two and a half hours long. <laughs> yeah. And that is a long time to, <laughs> to spend. spend with Arnold and yeah. Child I, John. And I think I have a feeling that the bit that we're pastiching, you know, like the long, laborious monologue scenes. Mm. I think they are from the extended version. Okay. Um, and so in the extended version, there's a bit more sort of hammy uh, teaching Arnie to high five and all that sort of thing. No, I think that's in the original. Mate. May- maybe teaching him to high five is, but I mean, I think there are a few there's, extra there's, scenes. There's, there's the, scenes, the scenes that didn't fit for me, right, were like John like just telling his life story to the robot like mm. oh, of course mum used to have any guy around to, yeah like it's like he's a fucking toaster like I, this is what always bugs me with robots and movies like in Ex Machina right yeah it's done in an interesting way because she's so human and so adept at learning that it's yeah. like interesting Arnold is not interested in learning no he's just like I'm here to save you and kill some people who wouldn't hurt you right it's not that's not a conversation and often he's yeah. just talking and Arnold just like pass me the wrench pass me the spanner because he's like working on a job that he's been told to do yeah it's mental. The, the bit that annoys me the most I think is um, and, and uh, what my point was going to be that if we're talking about stuff that you don't recognise then it's probably from the director's cut mm. but um, the uh, the bit where John cries and he goes like why are your eyes doing that yeah and it's like well I mean I get that he doesn't understand emotion mm. but he would know what tears yeah. are yeah. and tear ducts are like he would understand that that's a physiological response like because yeah. he's even said there's a conversation where he says something like i know everything about anatomy yeah and sarah's like oh so you're better at killing he's like correct well, yeah. yeah exactly so he would he would know about that yeah. like yeah it, so that sort of stuff where the mask slips a bit and there's a few other things where he like you can see him smiling and stuff, and it it just breaks the character. And I think in the original, it's so strong, yeah, and so consistent. Because you've got like one line, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. I'll be back. I, yeah, I, I think maybe he says that in the original. Yeah, but I think I think part of the problem is that Arnold Schwarzenegger in real life is like the most charismatic man in the world. Yeah, and like I think when we did the Terminator film, uh, when we did the Terminator origin- originally, yeah, we played a clip from his like. Uh, speech to graduates of yeah, university and yeah. it's like it's the most inspiring thing ever it makes you want to go out and like bench press 200 kilos yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. um and I, it's it's like by this point because obviously in the terminator no one really knew who he was and it's just like he'd had by this point i guess 10 years yeah 10 years of fame and like everyone would have been yeah terminator 2 he, arnie's gonna be I, back i reckon and he, he must he, have been I'm, I'm, I'm guessing but in 91 he must have been like the rock is now it must have been like getting a, a big guy to be yeah, a, a yeah, big Yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah. I, but I, th- I feel like you can tell, like there's just too many little moments where the mask slips. A bit. Yeah. And he's like, his charisma comes through yeah. and it doesn't work anymore. And like this problem becomes even more mm. apparent as the uh, as the films go on, as yeah. I'm sure we'll come to it at some point. So, But you liked it overall. 
overall, yeah. I mean, some some things have dated badly. Uh, those are things like the annoying fucking kid, like which in the nineties was probably like Bart Simpson. Yeah, yeah, you know, brought like, to life. Yeah, it's like oh, this is really this is this is funny. A, a kid being funny with adults is like the best thing ever. Yeah. Like Home Alone is out. Like children being rude. Wow, yeah. what a fucking amazing thing. You also got the the robot humor. So like the robot taking things literally that like he can't smile. Yeah. Like but that's been done better elsewhere now. Yeah. That's not I funny. I do quite like the 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 smiling scene. Yeah. Because it's like it is uh even though we talked about like why does he have like a visual display. Yeah. But we um, we talked about like uh that but it's like the way it like breaks down the smile in like yeah. animates it in that little grid format yeah, and then yeah. like presents pa- that, just yeah. pastes it onto his face and it is like a funny i don't know it's like a sort of gag that you'd get in future armor or something yeah, like that exactly yeah yeah i mean it the character reminded me of drax in guardians of the galaxy yeah because the, the gag is he just takes things literally because mm. he doesn't understand the nuanced human interaction yeah uh which arguably does it better than this as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree. Mm. Drax is uh, is very good in, in Guardians of the Galaxy. The other thing, the, the final thing that really wound me up in terms of like, that's so like dating it, mm. is that playing it bad to the bone when he, uh, yeah. he comes out. That's like camp now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mentioned before that I was sort of hoping that um, I'd watch it with my girlfriend and, and I'd vicariously enjoy the the twist that Arnie is good mm. through her, but actually watching it with that in mind, it's like, it's pretty clear that yeah. he's, he's not evil because they, they play up too much, like how cool he is. Yeah, exactly. Even, yeah. Right, right from the start, you know, taking the sunglasses, taking the shotgun, like when he's like swinging the shotgun round and all that sort yeah, of yeah. stuff. Like, and equally when the, the real villain in T-1000 is introduced, yeah. it's with like the, like Arnie gets like jukebox music, hmm. and the other guy gets like a creepy a, score. Yeah, like yeah. a synth pad. It's yeah. like <laughs> like you know yeah, yeah. threatening sort of sounds. But I, I I was like looking out for it, and I think that originally at least must have been the intention because like the um, the policeman that the T one thousand kills, mm. um, he sort of like it looks like he punches him yeah but then later on or like watching it with hindsight you think oh he's oh, probably he stabbed, stabbed him, him. Yeah. yeah but then like why did does he take his clothes no because he he because he, he doesn't because t- he it. touches him yeah right the, the so, camera pans around so it looks like he's taking his clothes yeah exactly but yeah. then like why does he keep his face like he keeps his own robot face but just dressed as a policeman now he doesn't have a robot face. Yeah, he does. He does. You see him. Robert Patrick is naked. Yeah. And you see Robert Patrick's face. That's true. And then, like, he... The policeman looks completely different. Oh, yeah. Then he's just got the clothes. Yeah. So he... It's weird. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, it doesn't... Consi- it's not consistent with everything that he does from that right. point onwards in the film. So what you should see is, like, some guy show up and then immediately afterwards yeah. is the policeman. The, the other thing that makes me laugh is when um, he is dressed as like the motorcycle cop, yeah. but he's just the motorcycle cop version of the cop version of himself. <laughs> so it's just him with a helmet on. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, it's like, does the T-1000 care about road safety? Or, yeah, yeah. And also like, is that an equivalent? I thought he could only make stuff of an equivalent size. So is there like a... He's got really thin feet. Is there, is, there like a, yeah. Yeah, is there like a plus minus of a certain percentage? Because he's had to make his head... Like, hit that helmet is his head. Maybe his his head is now hollow to make up for the helmet. Right, okay, maybe. Yeah. We don't know. It's it's all over the place. <laughs> but overall, though, I would say that the yeah. T-1000 is, is excellent. Yeah, and I think that I, what I said just now was things that have aged badly. Mm. Things that have aged well are the special effects. Yes. Like, they, they could have been a lot worse. I mean, we watched Mars Attacks last week or yeah. the week before. That was, like, appalling. Yeah. And this is years older than that and it looks still it quite looks, good yeah, yeah it's li- like i wonder whether the version we watched has gone through a remastering process it might have done but i think at the time it was groundbreaking and then you know maybe remastering it just retouching it a little bit mm. is fair game it's nowhere near like sort of star wars prequels levels of tampering no. it still looks like something that they did in 1991 exactly yeah but in a way that's like still impressive today and i think a lot of that owes to they're quite um 
uh, it, like economical with the way, like the shots that they pick to yeah. have the, yeah. the transformation. If, 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 if they can use a physical prop or Robert Patrick in real life, yeah, they will prefer to do that. Whereas now, I think they just prefer to use CGI. Yeah, but he like uh, he, um, for example, the scene that we, the shot that I think always is impressive every time is when he walks out of the fire like after the truck mm. he's driving crashes and he walks out as like a molten metal yeah. man and then like smoothly turns into a thing and like i think i think the way you know what they do is even in those shots where it's like very um uh like special effects heavy mm. it's essentially like a still shot yeah you know the camera's not moving around there's no great stuff going on in the background it's just the fire to worry about which they um you know they could put in they they add the reflection of his, of the fire in his molten form mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing and it and it works really well but i think you know they it's just very cleverly done and they've yeah. obviously designed it to or when the other, the other thing similar to that is when he moves up out of the like ground because mm. yeah. it's if it was just meant to be like chrome the whole time it mm. would look that's that's harder to do yeah but when he's like a pattern or when there's fire on him, it's a yeah. bit easier, I think. But it still does look, you know, look, it looks like patterned metal. Yeah. And all that sort of thing. It's, yeah. like it's, 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 you know, very good. Yeah. And I think the T-1000, like as a concept and the execution of that is very good. Like he's mm. the perfect foil for Arnie because like you couldn't have, like if it was just, you know, they got Chuck Norris to play another yeah, yeah. Terminator or whatever, it would be rubbish. But they've, they've obviously, like they obviously gave it some thought and like found the sort of the weakness opposite. Yeah. yeah and uh you know like the running the iconic run is very yeah like still good and frightening and exciting and yeah. thrilling and uh there's something i think like extra nasty about him like te- being able to turn into like knives and blades and needles and things mm. something just quite personal and like vicious about that yeah because he even he, he's got one point he's he's trying to get um Sarah to call out to John and he's got like a mm. a knife in his shoulder and he says I know this hurts yeah, yeah. and another one going to his, towards her eye yeah. and the the bit with uh, Todd uh, the foster father where he like just like yeah. punches a hole through his face and <laughs> what, into like the cupboard but what, what I always like about that scene right is that the, the knife thing happens say like at halfway four, through the scene yeah, yeah. and then yeah. at the end his his arm just drops. Yeah. So he's been holding up the milk the whole time, even yeah. though he's dead. <laughs> yeah, amazing. It's, it's it's very very well done. But it is there's something sort of something of the butcher about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not um, like like that. He that when he kills Todd, he's not doing it cleanly or surgically. No. He's doing it like to cause damage. Yeah. yeah, and I think um, I guess the implication as well, like as the movie progresses, is that maybe. The T one thousand is a bit flawed because he's got maybe more emotion than would benefit him as a robot. Mm. You know, like he he ends up sort of doing the whole wagging his finger and like saying things like "I know this hurts" or whatever. He's like he becomes less of a machine, mm. and it's almost like he's getting frustrated, and that's that's the point at which he yeah um, do loses. Do they mention at any point that he's? He's no, a, he's a prototype. So that that's all they say, really. Right. Yeah. But you know, it's it's just my reading of it, I yeah. guess. But we, he d- he does seem more like in tune. He's more human, isn't he? Like just the way he talks to people. Um, yeah. More emotional. Yeah, because he says like, "Oh, gee, buddy." Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Exactly. And like when he's talking to those girls, asking, you know, and they say, "Oh, he's he's John John's down the mall or whatever," mm. and he's going like. Oh really? You know, like well, that's, whereas if it was Arnie, it would just be like you just drive off, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> kill them both and yeah. drive off. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, th- I think he's a very iconic villain, yeah. not as iconic as Arnie for obvious reasons, but yeah, just because he, he's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's just as uh, interesting. So uh, the, I think an obvious comparison to make mm. with this and Terminator is the Alien to Aliens right. change in tone. Because uh, James Cameron directed it. Well, th- I mean, that that is a similarity, obviously. And like because, an obvious point um, of and because uh, John's uh, <laughs> foster mother is also an alien. Uh, is she? Yeah, she's the like Hispanic woman. 
Right. That like for some reason in this she's like a yeah like, like a Irish soccer descent. mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. She's also in Titanic. She's, she's a James Cameron favorite. Right. And obviously Michael Bean, who's in Terminator and then Aliens. Yes, exactly. Um, and Terminator Two. Briefly, yeah, yeah. in a dream. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, but I think you know the 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 change in tone in both instances between the first film and the second film is is quite similar. Like this feels much broader, mm. um, sillier, more action packed. Yeah. Uh, playing to a wider audience, all of the things that Aliens does. Yeah. It's a bit, um, it's a bit of a dumbing down. Yeah, but that's defi- not, that's it definitely not... lacks the nuance, and uh, not that there's a, a great deal of nuance really in the Terminator, but that yeah. you know what subtlety there is with you know the tension and how relentless um, the Terminator is mm. in the original is lost in this one, yeah. especially because the T1000 essentially disappears for about a third of the movie. Yeah, that's, between like that's the weird, as- isn't it? the asylum. Like he, they lose him at the asylum, and he doesn't show up again until mm. he's chasing them in a helicopter yeah. after they've um, ransacked uh, Cyberdyne. When you watch, uh, when you watch Terminator One, you feel like any point Arnold could just like burst into the room, and the, the yeah. whole movie you're just like dreading the next time he shows up. Yeah. Whereas in Terminator Two, it's like you know he's miles away, and that they're they're worrying about something completely different yeah he's not not as much of a constant like looming threat yeah like i guess as well that comes from the the sort of universe being expanded and Mm. there being the whole thing about them trying to stop judgment day because in the first one their only goal is to not die whereas in this one it's like don't die but also stop skynet from taking over but um at the same time i think there's like uh like uh, even though it's lacking in sort of nuance mm. there's so many like plot holes and muddy plot details and uh one thing i noticed is that uh you know imdb has the faq section mm-hmm. uh most faq sections for films are sort of five or six questions long yeah uh the one for terminator 2 has 39 <laughs> questions <laughs> so this is like just like clarify this for me sort of yeah and it yeah. is literally like picking up on like everything yeah. from from like uh you know tiny little details to like but if john if john succeeds then the terminator can't come back to protect him yeah yeah and then what happened like it's just yeah. well, i guess they the, the way they get around that is just to say the future is unwritten yeah it's essentially going don't don't worry about yeah. it just it's a movie <laughs> fuck off yeah and i think like to pick holes in a film that's about like time traveling robot assassins uh is a bit futile but i think also that it's like the film is trying to suggest that there's like especially as the, as the series goes on it's trying to suggest that there's like this funneled like locked in causality to everything mm. so it's like even if um you know they stop it in terminator 3 that it's revealed that they just basically postponed judgment day yeah they, it's in it's an inevitable thing to do with like progress yeah, yeah. and to to borrow uh, i don't watch doctor who mm. or i haven't for about 10 years sure sure and yeah, I but I, I i remember from watching it that there are that's the fucking lies police <laughs> come to get you <laughs> the nerd police yeah. uh in that there are sort of like uh fixed moments in time that always happen and it's a bit like that like so you know there are there are events that will mm. always end up happening yeah um as evidenced by the fact that uh robots keep coming back from the future yeah how many did they send back in the end at the start of this film they say it's happened twice yeah like you hear john john's voice i think is it either john's or kyle's voice or maybe it's sarah's voice actually a voice. Well, at the beginning of the film. The at the beginning of the film, yeah. The opening narration. Yeah. That's Sarah. That's Sarah, yeah. So Sarah says it twice they tried to kill Yeah. John. The first time they failed, and the second time, and then the film begins. So yeah. You, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then in Terminator 3, they send back the T... T something X, I think it's called. Yeah. And yeah. it's a woman. Yeah. Uh he makes her boobs bigger. Yeah. The first, first thing have you s- Have you heard the Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah, yeah, commentary? I love that. Yeah. We'll put a clip in here. Yeah. It's like... Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger 
Schwarzenegger's commentary yeah. on the Terminator 3 film. It is amazing. Like, and I think when the idea came up of the using a female Terminator, I said to myself, well, this is great because now we have something different. Then I just have to see my naked body arriving every time uh, when I come back from the future to the present time. Let's have a sexy girl for a change arrive from the future to the present time with a sexy body and just a Naka 10 figure and great physical appearance and beautiful face. This scene with the enlargement of the breasts was fantastic because, again, it was one of those things. I mean, in the movie it was used kind of like Okay, if that's what guys would like to see, if this, this world deals with big breasts, then so be it, I'm going to just have bigger breasts. But in the audience, there was this uh, kind of like immediately, you saw women sitting there telling each other, this is, oh, that's a great idea, you have to check out where, the, where you get that done. Because there's some guys that like little breasts and there's some guys that like big breasts, so it's, wouldn't it be nice if you can play both sides, you know, and sometimes even simultaneously. So that's three. Uh, and then after that, I haven't seen Salvation. Salvation all takes place during the war. So John Connor's already an adult. Uh, and so that, I don't think, has any time-travelling element. All it has is um, a man who doesn't realise he's a Terminator. Um, so like a Terminator sleeper agent. Right. And then um, also at the end they're like trying to blow up the skynet factory or whatever and it's um a, a sort of cgi um version of arnie appears in salvation yeah and then in genesis there oh. is uh well we see what a mess. three i think in genesis so you see the original terminator yeah from the terminator who for some reason is then stopped by Sarah. New old Arnie. No, he's stopped by Sarah. I oh, know he, sh he shoots him. He's like, "I've been waiting for you." Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Scottish Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger. Yeah, he uh, he turns up, and so that that's another one. Then there's the Asian police officer. So, uh, yeah, the T one thousands now. That's not the T one thousand. No, it's it's another T something. Um. And then there's the... Who gets, like, dissolved in acid, I think. Mm. And then there's the, like, Skynet that... Um, Is John hacks Connor. Hacks John Connor. Or, you know, like, infects John Connor like a virus and turns him into a Terminator. Because it's... Um, nanobots. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's nanobots over a skeleton or something. That's Terminator Genesis for you. Sequel to which has been indefinitely postponed. Can't think why. <laughs> it was such a good film. Yeah. So, uh, I I mean, the, the franchise went off a bit, didn't it, after this? Are we going to do any more of the Terminator films? I hope not. Well, there you go. Email in, show at gmail.com yeah. if you'd like Joe to change his mind. So what do we know, Joe? What do we know about the various threats? Uh, threat number one. Tell me what you know about the T-1000. Um, apparently dogs bark at it. Yes. Uh, like, yes. Cause in, in the first film, yeah. I took it, because they use dogs, like, because dogs can sense whether someone's human or not, right? Right. So there's a scene where uh, a Terminator comes into the, the compound. This is like in, in Kyle Reese's flashback, which is actually in the future. Right. Like a Terminator comes into their compound and the dogs start barking and they say, oh shit, it's a Terminator. Yeah. And it opens fire on them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a harrowing scene. But the reason the dogs know it's not human is because they're like trained, presumably, to say, like, this is a human, this is not a human. But dogs also bark in the past at, yeah, at the T-800 T uh, Arnie uh, in the original. Oh, really? Mm. That's why she has a dog. And when they're at the motel, yeah, right. there's, there's a barking dog which, uh, you know, tips them off. But yeah, if they, they, they've got some sort of preternatural... Uh, Terminator sensing thing. But why? Don't question it. Uh, like, we're talking about the T-1000. Dogs don't <laughs> bark at anything. We're talking about the T-1000. Well, the thing that I said last time was that uh, at the end of the film, Sarah Connor's got a dog. Yeah. And it's like, is she just going to shoot everything that everyone that the dog, the dog barks at? Like, he's a maniac. Um, no wonder she's in an asylum. Uh, yeah, so what, what do we know about Skynet, Joe? Eh? Not a lot more because it gets destroyed. 
Well, it takes a li- little over a month to become self-aware because mm. um, they plug it Once in at it the start live. of August. Yeah. yeah, start of August and then end of August, it, it all kicks off. Um, they say, like, oh, it became self-aware, mm. fully self-aware. On this, August. The singularity, right? Yeah, uh, August 29th. Where is the singularity forever. when humans and computers converge? I don't I can't remember. It's one of those. Uh, but what my question is, was there no oversight... Like, could they see the extent to which Skynet was becoming self-aware? I doubt it. So it was just like, not self-aware, not self-aware, self-aware. Like, possibly suddenly, like a, well, a like, switch had been flicked. The- in theory, yes, that's possible. Because if, you, if you're developing an AI, um, and, I mean, y- your point is you're trying to make it self-aware, I think. But the, right. prob- the problem is wh- when they did that, it became, like, super defensive. Mm-hmm. To the point of being like offensive and mm-hmm. trying to kill everyone, um, so that they they couldn't have like I think he says in the movie like Dyson says we didn't know that was going to happen we thought we were yeah. doing good. Well, the the um, he just wanted like, a pile a, a pile that doesn't get drunk. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Well, the um, yeah the 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 idea is that it's like they realise that it's become self aware and how dangerous that is and try to unplug it basically yeah but it's too late and as a retaliation for that for them trying to shut down skynet they get bombed yeah exactly chat shit get banged so uh what about the other third enemy in the film joe and that's uh determinism yeah there is no fate but what we make joe mm-hmm. uh, that's what they say in the film but as we've said in terminator 3 basically there is fate well but that, that, that's the question there's two options there's two things at play here either no matter what you do, like Skynet will happen. Yeah. Or alternatively, uh, due to humans' natural like urge to create and to to develop science. Yeah. That Skynet will always be, or Skynet something like Skynet. Yeah, like Skynet be. is just a name for the moment that this thing happens. Yeah. Like we're we're trying to develop computer technology. Eventually, if you develop it far enough. You're mm. going to develop AI, and it's going to become sentient. And yeah. the the problem with a computer becoming sentient is that it becomes defensive, etc. Yeah, I mean, it, the 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 difference, I suppose, is that if like the computer that becomes self-aware, rather than being plugged into like the military network, is just plugged into like Radio One or mm. whatever, it might just start playing the songs that it wants to play <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> as opposed to dropping its entire nuclear yeah. arsenal on Russia. Well, that, that's, the, that's the weird thing as well, because this is made in 91, mm-hmm. which is the internet existed or the World Wide Web existed, but it wasn't... Just. It was, it's not yeah. really in popular no, exactly. imagination, it, is it? I think if James Cameron had made a film about it, people would have been like, that's hokum. Yeah. Uh, so, what in, in the movie, you'd have watched it and thought, oh, well, how are these computers talking to each other? Mm. Whereas if it's made today, it'd be like, oh, I see, it just spread and copied its files as like a virus. Yeah. Whereas back then, it would be like, that's mental. Yeah. And obviously, to keep it up to date, uh, that's why in Genesis, the virus can <laughs> jump to humans and rewrite DNA as nanobots or whatever. Mm. Yep. Well, uh, we're going to do something slightly different for um, How to Survive this week. Uh, So we're going to have an idea each for Mm. How to Survive. Mm. And then obviously because we're talking about nuclear war being Joe's phobia, uh, we're going to talk a bit about nuclear war and why... Why it's so scary. Why is Joe afraid of it? Yeah. Um, So Uh, yeah, what's your your How to Survive idea for Terminator 2? I sort of cheated a bit. I've actually gone for one, like, scenario and with several options. Right. Okay. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Yeah. We, we're very freeform here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a moot point because Sarah and John both survive. Mm. But we always say, if, is that, if that's Could the case... Could they have survived how, better? Exactly, yeah. So Sarah is locked in a mental asylum, as you, as you recall. Yeah. Um, so my first first idea there is to have some level of self-awareness and say, right, I'm locked here because they think I'm mental. Yeah. I will at least pretend that I'm not mental. Well, it's not pretending. It's just like. Does she have the faculties to do that though? Because she is also a bit mad. Yeah. Like, like as dri- you driven mad by the trauma of, like Kyle dying and being chased to to, to near death by a machine. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that. That's the thing, right? Because 
in in this movie, she tries to manipulate them by pretending that she's got like control of it. Yeah, and then she and she he, he's like, fails, no, I don't believe you. Like it's a bit of a catch twenty two. Mm. Um, because in catch twenty two, obviously it's like <clears throat> you have to be mad to do this. Yeah, but if you say you don't want to do it, if you say you're mad, then you like you have to do it anyway. Sort of thing. Yeah, no, like it's it's the same thing is to do is to pretend to be mad. Yeah, the same thing to do here is to pretend not to be mad. Mm. But no one will believe you. But if that's because she's like had like years and years of fighting and telling them that the Terminator's coming. Yeah. If on day one she'd been like, you know what, that was my fugue state, <laughs> like in Breaking Bad, right? Or like, oh no, that was just a misunderstanding. Hmm. Uh, I'm actually normal now. That would have helped her a lot better earlier on. And then he might have gone like, okay, we'll transfer you to a minimum security place. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I get I get what you mean. It's uh Yeah. Um like I said, my only issue with it is whether or not um she actually has the capacity to do it. Yeah. Because she does seem a bit sort of emotionally Unhinged. traumatized. Yeah. yeah. Um and also let's not forget that she's not just locked up because they think she's mad, mm. it's because she also tried to bomb a, like a computer factory. The operative word is tried. Yeah, but then like she did it and is trying to excuse the reason like she's trying to use the fact that robots are going to take over the world right. as an excuse for what she did as opposed to you know that she's just been talking about how robots are going to fe- and mm. you know the thing is though if 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 um, this is this is pure speculation at this point if she'd been caught in the act of trying to blow that up and they'd said right you're under arrest and she'd gone oh, robots are going to kill us all yeah she'd been taken to the psych ward and if they'd assessed her and said, yeah, she's mental. Mm. If the next day she'd have gone, look, I feel a lot better now. Um, and, go to prison. And, and consistently, no, because she you, she did it under the... Right. Like, so it's, 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 it's innocent yeah, by then, way of insanity, isn't it? Right. But is that how that works? I like, don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think it's like, oh, if you can prove that you were briefly insane mm. to murder someone or bomb a place, then we'll let you go because you're not insane as we're talking to you now. I don't think that's how it works. Because surely people would just be doing that all the time. I don't know enough about it. I don't know either. But yeah, I I take your point that she could have tried to act sane. I just, my only issue is Mm. whether or not that was within her capabilities. Fair point. Um, For my survival idea, I was going to say that um, there's a scene where the T-1000 is chasing after their car and sort of dives onto the Boot with yeah. uh, hooks. Yeah, famous scene. Yeah, much prestige, especially, especially in The Simpsons. When uh, do you remember this one? I think so. Yeah, mm, like Homer wants to go to mini golf. Right, and Ned. he's got the yeah. he's got the mini golf clubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They uh, they shoot off one of the hooks. Yeah, um, and then it's it's stuck in the uh, in the boot, yeah. and uh, yeah. I think and John flicks it off. Flicks it off. Yeah. Um, now, here's my suggestion. The, uh, though we see like the metal uh, melting in the foundry and rejoining as a liquid form mm-hmm. after it gets uh, he gets shot to pieces during that scene in the with the car chase it doesn't turn back into liquid until he approaches it like you know gets close enough to yeah, it yeah. Um, so basically my suggestion is just to keep bits of him yeah try as hard as you can to just shoot parts off, off of him, him. yeah yeah and then just keep them because from what I can see, they'll remain as solid metal mm. until they're within a certain, you know, Wi-Fi radius or whatever. The the problem with that is that if you collect enough pieces, then you're gonna <laughs> you're <laughs> yeah. gonna have him That's in a bag. Yeah. And he'll just re reform. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh but you could, you know, put put it in a safe or something. Yeah. Like you could put all the parts in a safe and then lock the safe. That might work. But yeah, basically, my, my like you're not gonna lose out by uh, keeping that little bit of him because he's gonna be even if it just means that he's gonna be an inch shorter or something like that. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah, uh, his reach will be affected. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was basically the um, summation of of my survival idea is just to shoot off as many bits of him as you can. Yeah, and they like keep them in separate places. Yeah, like just put them in a like drive a mile. Mm off course down the road and just throw it into the desert or something yeah bury it like yeah, six exactly. feet deep yeah yeah fair point 
chuck it in the ocean yeah. whatever that does raise a question for me which I'll come to shortly but I, like I said I cheated and came up with a few more survival ideas this is a quick fire right and okay. I think they're, they're, they're more silly than anything they're more plot points just ignore your sedatives is one because presumably Sarah has been sedated heavily over the time she's been in right the, uh, the mental hospital and we see her get sedated with an injection hmm and like the the guard comes in and licks her face, so you, and she's pretending to be like under the effects of the sedative. Therefore, she she yeah, seems she, she can just choose not to be sedated, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, so just do that at any point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other point is uh, health and safety in the foundry. Right. Everyone like as soon as the truck crashes, like all the foundry staff just like run out and leave yeah. everything turned on, mm. and then don't come back for like half an hour. Yeah, just leave the leave the people in there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess that's basically just a plot device so that there's yeah. not like 30 witnesses to uh, yeah. two giant metal men fighting each other. But that brings up one big problem I've got with it, right? which is that when the T-1000 gets frozen solid by the liquid nitrogen, mm. he thaws out like really quickly and comes back together. Mm-hmm. Well, admittedly, he's malfunctioning a little bit, but he does like his temperature returns to like base level. Mm-hmm. When he gets put in the foundry and like melted... Presumably, they're going to like make something out of that still. Yeah. So like, there'll be a table made of some part of the T one thousand. Yeah. So when that like cools down, it will just be. Like, but is it not like? Uh, I don't know. Like maybe the. Oh, like the 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 silly way of imagining it would be that there's just like a computer chip floating in the middle of the giant metal alloy. Right. Do you know what I mean? Okay. And. Um, like maybe if it if that's melted, then it's not going to be able to. Do you know what I mean? Like it won't. It'll be completely um, disintegrated. Whereas when he's frozen and smashed, yeah, he's just being broken into small constituent parts, as opposed to completely destroyed, like being broken down yeah. on a cellular basis. Right. I see what you mean. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So mm. maybe maybe that's it. But I feel like I'm being a bit of an apologist for the yeah. film. I, I my understanding of it was always that the metal itself was aware. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you might be right. So that brings us neatly on, <laughs> anyway, to uh, your um, the the basis for this episode, really, doesn't it? Uh, which is um, your fear of nuclear Armageddon. Yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily like nuclear Armageddon, mate. Because if my my fear is more of like one bomb falling near me, right, or like close enough to. So you don't care about other people. <laughs> like if 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 a bomb went off in like. North Korea, right? Hmm. I would be like appalled and horrified. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. that that would be despicable. Yeah, the spectre of Hiroshima and Nagasaki yeah. is still affecting. To yes, you. yeah, we'll come to that in a minute. Right, but but like in terms of like immediate fear, yeah, like a bomb falling on the other side of the world is not as much as an issue as like a, a bomb, bomb falling, falling in London. Yeah. yeah, like I live in like the outskirts of West London. If a bomb fell in London, I probably would survive the initial blast. Yeah. But the effects would be pretty devastating. Hmm. Um, Not to mention the sort of humanitarian issues. Exactly. People like, fleeing and all sorts. Yeah. It's, I don't know if you've seen the movie When the Wind Blows. No. That was... Uh, we, we were agonising over what film to mm. watch for your fear. Yeah. And it's quite difficult to find one that's appropriate for our sort of... Yeah. Because um, nuclear war, by its by its definition, I mean the only the only real world examples you've got are Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. You've got various tests um, where like, the land's been damaged and like the, the the plant life and the the flora and fauna have been like mutated. Yeah. But in terms of human impact, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the real ones. And hmm. when the wind blows, it's made by Raymond Briggs, who yeah. made the Snowman. You know, the yeah. we're walking in the air. Well, yeah. Yeah, similar style and everything. Exactly, yeah, it? this hand-drawn animation style. And mm-hmm. it's about this couple who live in, like, Surrey. And they're, like, they're elderly, so they lived through World War Two, mm-hmm. And they're, like, reading the paper, and they're, like, you know, they're just a like, very sweet couple. They, they, there's a f- phone call with his son, and he's like, oh, yes, you, you should, if you want to put a, a pipe up, you should ask me. Like, it's yeah, really sweet yeah. stuff. Like, they're all retired. And they're just pottering around and they said, oh, there's, apparently there's going to be a, a war. And they say, oh, you know, we got through one war, we'll get through the other one. And they they just, they just discussed lightly like what would happen if there was a bombing. And they're like, oh, no, we'll just take cover. And he's like, no, I think it'll be a little worse than that. They just, they, they just read like, re, like 
yeah pamphlet yeah. or something that's yeah pamphlet. like like your, like your grandparents talk about the internet like they just don't yeah. quite get it and then the bomb falls and it's like in like it just takes this like scenic nice village and just destroys it and like then they're like living like animals for the rest of the movie and like there's just weird shit happening like that. obviously they they come to radiation sickness hmm. but they go outside and like there's just like shadows like scorched onto the lawn and the milk bottles are melted and it's just like really surreal weird things that would happen mm. in a nuclear bomb and they're just like yeah Unca- they, they, they uncanny just, sort of stuff yeah exactly they just don't quite understand it yeah and they just gradually die of fallout yeah. it's pretty harrowing yeah have you seen it uh, no I haven't but I, I've I know enough about it to uh, from my various retellings of it. yeah <laughs> just every time we meet up yeah oh should we go get a point let yeah. me tell you about this old couple we lived in Surrey <laughs> I mean like there's like I to say I'm obsessed with the nuclear war would be a bit much, mm. but I have read around it a lot, and like I, is it like trying to understand your fear? Sort of it thing? is a bit like that. Yeah, it's like you know, it's like some people find serial killers fascinating, mm. or they th- they find like a morbid fascination in certain things. Yeah, I think to some extent I have that with nuclear nuclear bombs yeah. or the effects of them. Is it true to say that when you were younger you used to lie awake at night, like thinking of yes nuclear bombs for yeah exactly it, because it's it's one of those things where it's like it, it gets you at the right time yeah in your life mm. and you just you can never really shake it it's just a bit of a, a fear you you have <laughs> it gets you at the right time in the, of your life like listening to the smiths or something. yeah <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um i mean the, the way that sarah connor describes it in the movie mm. is it's like a giant strobe light burning right through my eyes but somehow I can still see what well, she's dreaming. In reality, she'd be blind. The children look like burnt paper, black, not moving. And then the blast wave hits and they fly apart like leaves. Like that's not dissimilar to like first person accounts of like what yeah. happens. Yeah. There's a long read article that I recommend people seek out. It's in the New Yorker from around the time of the Hiroshima bomb. So maybe around 1950, maybe. It's, uh, it's just called Hiroshima. It's by John Hersey. And it's... It's an account of like what happened in Hiroshima that day. Like so, the mm. morning is a, a few survivors' accounts of like what they got up, what they were doing, and how that's like their normal day. Yeah, I think I've read this. Then, yeah. yeah, the bomb falls, and it's just like their lives are just destroyed. Yeah, and it's it's understandably like nightmarish, isn't it? It's yeah. like yeah, you know, buildings just like not being there anymore, yeah. and the sky's on fire. Yeah, apparently, like no one, like, people report that they don't hear any sound. Like no, all the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki say like they don't say like it was a loud bang. Mm. It's just like a blinding light, and people were saying like their eyes were burnt out of their heads and stuff. So you end up with people with like third degree burns all over their bodies, clothes just burnt off, but hot eyes burnt out of their heads. They're yeah. they're, they're dead on their feet, they're just wandering around like looking for help. Yeah, but all the water evaporates as well. Right, so. There's just like nothing you can do except yeah. just burn. Um, yeah. So when, when when the bomb falls, you get burnt to death instantly if you're in the immediate zone. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're badly burned to the point where you're going to die. Like mm-hmm. the skin's gone. You, there's no way you can survive. And also, because you, you're exposed to radiation, you the the skin cells are dying. Yeah. So you can't repair your skin. Yeah. So even if you were like that badly burned on a good day, mm. you're fucked. Your skin yeah. is done. Uh, or your eyes are burnt out of your head, or your head's or you burnt off, whatever. Or if you're even further out than that, you succumb to radiation sickness hmm. and you get cancer. And yeah. that's why there's no real good outcome of being no. near a bomb when it goes off. That's now, why it's my fear. The, uh, the, the counter argument to this is that it's so horrifying that um, like it's unlikely to happen do you know what i mean like a, an all-out nuclear war mm. would be obviously there's mutually assured destruction which yeah exactly. which would mean that everyone essentially would die so that's the incentive to not drop a nuclear bomb um and so but but it you're not re it's not that sort of scenario no like more, I, i'm not i'm not like fearful for the future of mankind yeah i'm fearful for like what would happen if you, I was you alive. Were there. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I, do you know what I think it is? It's watching Terminator Two that gave me this because I remember really? watching it as a child, like probably too young. But that's mm. not that's not to like put anything on my mum because I watched it with her. I remember. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think she did what misjudged what was involved. And it's that scene where 
you know, the, the children are playing and they get burnt to leaves, like she says. Yeah. It's, it just sticks with you, man. It's yeah, it's, like, it's disturbing. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, I think, I think the nightmarish idea is being like close enough, mm. but not close enough. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's like, what we say. It's best to yeah. go in the blast, right? Yeah. But even that wouldn't be pleasant. Like you'd be atomized. Yeah, but you'd, would you, you'd not really know anything about it. If, the, if, like, if a bomb fell on this building now, we wouldn't know. Yeah. But if we were like two miles away, we'd see like our eyes would be burnt out of our heads. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's that level of like horror. Yeah. It's just I don't know, man. It's that's that's. I mean, you asked why I'm scared of it. Yeah. It's because like it's the worst imaginable fate. I think I think for me it's almost like I can't. It's so incomprehensibly mm. frightening that I I can't. It's like I I can't. I don't have the energy to dedicate to being frightened of it. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. it's it's too much to fathom. It's such like an unfathomably terrifying idea mm. that I can't dedicate the energy to to worrying about it because it's it's beyond my control. Obviously, yeah, and also like. You know, it would just be so. It would be the end of your end of the world, like yeah, in a very real sense. Yeah. yeah. So, like, it's you know, given that I have no control over it, it's like, what? Why would I worry about it? Because it's it's like, so I, yeah, I, you, I can neither do anything to prevent it, mm-hmm. nor do anything that would make any tangible difference difference in the event. So, do you do you feel about it the same way you'd feel about like? you don't worry about like a piano falling on your head when you walk down the street. Yeah, exactly. Like, th- yeah, you, th- these things could happen. Yeah, but, but they're so unlikely. Yeah, because... and they're so out of my control yeah. that, you know, like the the floor that we stood on at the moment, this, like this building could collapse. Like, yeah. but I don't spend my life fearful of walking into buildings. On that note, maybe we should uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> step out into the open <laughs> to a field somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean... Do you do you see why? That, yeah, de- definitely. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think it's probably one of those in, like things where the more you read about it, the worse it gets. As opposed to like you know, yeah. sometimes you read about something that frightens you and you sort of take ownership of it. And like the more you know about it, the more yeah, like you feel hardened against it. But I don't think that nuclear Armageddon no, exactly. is, is like, one what are you going to do? Dig yeah. a hole in your garden? Exactly. Like, it's, it's mental. Yeah. Live live in the wilderness. You can't outrun a bomb. Right? Yeah, I know, but it's just you, you have to look at what the least tactically significant uh, location is for mm. whatever country you're living in and move there because that's the least likely place to be bombed. Yeah, right. So next week we'll be recording in the Highlands of Scotland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, Scottish people aren't going to like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. so... Uh, well, do you feel better for talking about it? No, much worse. Right, great. So uh, we'll reconvene next week to, <laughs> to do the same for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, if anyone is interested in sharing in my phobia, I would recommend reading that Hiroshima article mm. by John Hersey, which Google Hiroshima John Hersey or Hiroshima New Yorker and you'll find it. It is a fascinating read and yeah. a, a really deep personal story. Um, yes. if you, if, I mean, like, uh, if you're into my, This American Life, uh, it's along those sort of lines of like yeah. the in-depth human struggle that came with this this event. Uh, also, watch when the wind blows, the Raymond Briggs film. Also, there was a BBC documentary called Threads, mm. which is about like Sheffield being yeah. bombed. Yeah, yeah, and it's like that's harrowing as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, and also watch Terminator 2 yeah Judgment Day <laughs> <laughs> but ahead of next week, make sure you watch The Descent, the uh, 2005 Neil Marshall horror movie. Um, it's available on Netflix in the UK so you've got no excuse because it is uh, consistently rated as one of the best horror movies ever made so um, Mm. yeah Uh, find out what we think about that next week and we'll talk about uh, why we've picked that as my sort of phobia Mm. film we've picked that as your phobia yes yeah yeah. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch how to survive show at gmail.com or at how to survive pod on Twitter Mm. and uh, we shall see you next week see you next week The unknown future rolls toward us. I face it for the first time with a sense of hope. Because if a podcast 
how to survive, can learn the value of human life, maybe we can too. The thing is, mate, right? You know, the it's the T-1000 runs around everywhere, yeah. chases after them. Yeah. Why doesn't, like, like running is not the most efficient use of energy. Right. So why doesn't why he turn he... himself into a wheel and just roll after them? Uh, because most of the time he's in public. That shouldn't matter. He's got one task, which is to kill John Connor. That's true, yeah. Like, if, if, if someone sees him killing John Connor, that's kind of a moot point. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's like if if modern day humans see a robot killer, they'll be less inclined to create robot soldiers in the future. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Might act as a sort of whistle blowing moment. But the, the humans don't make their soldiers. The like Cybernet does. No, no, no. They do. They do. Do they? Yeah. Well, and they re, re- regionally, yeah. In Terminator 3, uh, you even see a video where uh, Arnie plays an American sergeant who is the model for the T-800, the T which doesn't even make sense given that we see in the original Terminator that there's loads of different models. Yeah. Like, they look all different. Uh, but it's Arnie with a really broad Southern American accent. And he's like, hi, I'm Sergeant Candy. And uh, they dubbed. Yeah, he's dubbed. And he's like, uh, hi, I'm Sergeant Candy. And I'm honored to be the, uh, you know, like really comically uh, Southern American, South of American, uh, South of the United States accent. And they watch this video, like all the US Army chiefs, chiefs, chiefs. And um, then one of them goes, hmm. Not sure about that voice. And the guy who works for Cyberdyne or whatever, who is playing the video, turns around and looks at him and goes, We can fix that. Hi, I'm Chief Master Sergeant William Candy. I was honored to be selected by CRS in the ongoing effort to save American lives. I don't know about that accent. We can fix it. <laughs> 